Um, so today we will be, our student launch SL will be giving their preliminary design report. This is what they've been working on the past two months, essentially since the beginning of the year. This is um, the first step in their, the NASA project. So after this, we'll be doing CDR, critical design review. But for now, we'll be doing this report and a presentation, which is going to be given to NASA in about two weeks. So before we begin with that, I think IREC has a few announcements to give. Adam is here. Yeah, sure. Um, Adam's right here, but I'll be giving the announcement. Um, so basically, we've been at the lab manufacturing. We have some manufacturing going on behind us. Uh, we'll go more in depth about that in a little bit. Um, are we, when are we talking about that, the manufacturing? Oh, right now? Okay. Um, yeah, so basically they're doing the fin fillets right now. Um, they're pouring epoxy down the side to get the fins. I can, I bring can turn off screen share if you want to share. Yeah. Yours. Okay, okay. We're going, we're going on a quest. Uh, okay. Okay, hello team members. So here it is. Uh, basically, it's the same idea that you'll have for your SL rocket if you're in that side. Um, basically, there's epoxy going down these fillets so that we could get more um, contact with our glue, have more attachment points. Um, yeah, we're going down here. Uh, we did a couple of the external ones, but they're a little bit ugly right now, so we're probably going to have to sand them. Yeah, here they are. Um, there's a little bit of weights on the side there. But yeah, that's what we're up to right now. Um, we're also 3D printing some parts for the avionics and recovery um, sled thing. Uh, so yeah, we're 3D printing those. Um, we're doing bulkheads right now as well. Um, so yeah, next manufacturing meeting that we call, some, some peeps should come out here. We, have, we can have up to 10 people in the lab and we usually have about five. So we have enough slots for people to come by. Um, lots of hands-on work going on. Um, additionally, uh, we found out in IREC that um, our report is a bit more extensive than we initially thought. So um, we're coming together with a um, basically a template for things that we need done for the report. So um, you can learn a lot about um, basic uh, like picking out parts and stuff, um, something that you I'm sure already have experience in with SL. So yeah, um, basically we're going to be doing a bunch of design matrix uh, drawing files that like you would see in DML. So if you haven't taken DML yet, you can learn stuff that you'll um, use in DML. And yeah, it'll be super fun. Anything else? Okay, cool. Um, please show us your amazing presentation. I'll go ahead and share screen. All right, are you guys able to see the, uh, presentation for PDR? Yeah. Okay, so the PDR presentation is part of our competition with NASA, like Noel said. Um, basically how this is gonna work is we're gonna present and just like you would in a normal uh, GBM, please ask us questions. I mean, NASA at the end of every presentation uh, likes to really grill us on questions. So anything you're not sure about or anything that you can, that you see that we can improve in our presentation, just please at the end, we'll have a open forum basically where you guys can ask us anything, um, give us any feedback, anything that we can improve, uh, please do so. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we are a Swamp Lodge rocket team, at the University of Florida. We'll start with some brief introductions from each of our sub-team leads. My name is Dylan Rodowski, and I'm the team's project manager. Hello, my name is Joel Perez. I'm the structures lead. Hello, my name is Matthew Estinos, and I'm the flight dynamics lead. Hello, my name is Colin Lark. I'm the avionics and recovery lead. Hello, my name is Alexander Creston and I'm the payload lead. Hi, my name is Ireland Brown and I'm the treasurer. Hi, my name is Chaz Wilson and I'm the safety officer. Hi, my name is Megan Wanak and I'm the testing lead. 
All right, so I'll get right into a system level overview. We will be using a five and a half inch blue poop airframe with four independent sections. The vehicle's total length is 11.7 feet, the weight of 36.2 pounds. We decided on a four section configuration to allow us to separate our payload from our main and drogue parachutes. As you can see here, we have our main or we have our payload section up front followed by our central section with our main parachute and our aft section with our drogue parachute. We considered two alternative system designs and in each of these designs, the vehicle had only three independent sections. So for this first design, we stored the payload with the main parachute and would have used a Jolly Logic on the main to separate the main payload parachute deployments. For the second alternative, we had the uh, forward section contain only the payload and the aft section contain both parachutes. This would again uh, use a Jolly Logic on the main parachute. For both of these alternatives, we were limited by the lack of available redundancy within the Jolly Logic. The four system alternative is the most complex of the three, but uh, it does allow for the great, greatest reliability. Launch vehicle. Now, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> so as we said earlier, the launch vehicle it consists of four sections, which is the nose cone, payload bay assembly, central section, and aft section. The nose cone is Von Karman in design. Within, within the nose cone is a bulkhead and GPS. The nose cone connects to the payload bay airframe with short four shear pins. Next slide, please. The payload bay assembly consists of the payload bay airframe the pay and the payload bay payload avionics bay. The payload bay will consist will contain the payload. The payload bay assembly connects to the nose cone and central section. Next slide, please. The launch vehicle supports two avionics bays. Within the avionics bay will be recovery electronics, which will be used to deploy um, both parachutes. The payload, there is two avionics bays. One is attached to the payload bay assembly and one is attached to the central section. Next slide, please. The central section consists of the central airframe and the central avionics bay. The central section central section will contain the main parachute and recovery system. The central section connects to the payload section and the aft section. Next slide, please. The aft section consists of the aft airframe, motor assembly, and fins. The aft section will contain the drogue parachute and recovery system. The motor assembly is contained in the aft with a set of three centering rings. They will be epoxied in. There is also a set of four fins which connect through the airframe. Next slide, please. Decision matrices were used to evaluate the performance of a material for each component. The nose cone was evaluated for tensile strength, cost, and density. The leading design was fiberglass with an overall score of 8.16. Next slide, please. Airframe couplers were evaluated for tensile strength, cost, density, and machinability. Blue tube was the leading design with a score of 6.07. Next slide, please. Bulkheads were evaluated for tensile strength, cost, density, machinability, and durability. Plywood was the leading design with a score of 6.89. Next slide, please. Centering rings were evaluated for shear strength, cost, density, machinability, durability. Plywood was the leading design with a score of 7.09. Next slide, please. Fins were evaluated for cost, tensile strength, shear modulus, density, and machinability. Structural FRP fiberglass was a leading design with a score of 7.05. Next slide, please. 
epoxy was evaluated for cost, tensile strength, availability, heat tolerance, and handling time. JB Weld was the leading design with a score of 7.97. Next slide, please. The static stability margin was determined as a function of the rocket diameter, center of pressure location, and center of gravity location. These points are depicted on the model with a red circle symbol for the center of pressure at 105 inches from the nose and a checkered blue circle symbol for the center of gravity at 89.66 inches from the nose. The static stability margin of the vehicle on the pad was calculated to be 2.74 calibers. The simulation allowed us to plot the variation in static stability margin with, with time. And at the time of rail exit, it was determined to be 2.79 calibers, well above the two caliber requirement. Next slide, please. Three primary motors were evaluated, the K1000T, L1150, and LA50W. The most important criterion for the evaluation was the difference between our target apogee altitude and the simulated apogee altitude for the rocket with each motor. The second most important criterion was the static stability margin at rail exit in order to meet requirements. The cost of each motor was also evaluated along with the maximum Mach number during flight. Based on this evaluation, the L1150 Redline rocket motor was chosen for our preliminary design. Its thrust curve was determined from manufacturer information with the thrust to weight ratio being approximately 7.13. According to our simulation, the velocity at rail exit would be 72.9 feet per second, well over the requirement. Next slide, please. The separation points chosen will ensure that the deployment of the payload and the parachutes will be assisted by gravity. The mass of the energetics was determined using the ideal gas law and the placement of the charges was so that it would push the parachutes and payload out as they are deployed. The payload will be deployed using a charge well, which will be attached to the forward avionics bay. And the main and drogue parachutes will be deployed using a floating charge. A floating charge is a charge that is loose in the airframe. Uh, next slide, please. The drogue parachute was evaluated on weight, cost, the coefficient of drag, and the quality of the parachute. Coefficient of drag was used to, to assess the different parachutes as a representation of the descent rate due to the parachutes all being the same size. The 24 inch ripstop standard low porosity 1.1 ripstop parachute was chosen with an overall score of 6.8. Uh, next slide, please. The main, main parachute was assessed on descent rate, cost, weight, and durability slash quality. Uh, descent rate was used in this decision matrix due to the parachutes being different sizes. Um, the 84 inch Rocketman elliptical parachute was selected with an overall score of 6.8. Next slide, please. The payload parachute was assessed on descent rate, cost, weight, and quality slash durability. The selected parachute was the 48 inch Rocketman elliptical with an overall score of 9.6. Next slide, please. The recovery harness was assessed using carrying capacity, length, density, width, and cost. Uh, density was used to, to determine the durability of the different materials. Density was used because it was given by the manufacturers and it was not something that we had to find ourselves. Uh, the Wildman rocketry Kevlar, 7 sixteenths of an inch wide tubular Kevlar was chosen with an overall score of 8.7. Uh, next slide, please. The attachment hardware was assessed using carrying capacity, weight, cost, attachment points, inner diameter, and the space required for attachment. Um, attachment points was assessed so that when the force is applied to the attachment hardware, it can evenly spread out or more evenly spread out the, the weight, the force, if it has more attachment points on the bulkhead. Uh, space required was assessed negatively because the more space it took up on the bulkhead, the less room for terminals or ejection charges. The 304 stainless steel eye bolt with an inner diameter of three quarters of an inch was selected with an overall score of 6.2. Next slide, please. The 
Forward avionics bay altimeter was assessed on the number of programmable channels, price, weight, and the difficulty of assembly. The number of fully programmable channels was important because these two deployments will be happening at 800 feet and 600 feet, respectively. Um, and some altimeters only allow for a deployment at Apogee and one other programmable altitude. Assembly difficulty was assessed due to the assessment of kit altimeters that require assembly by the team. The Anticore AIM altimeter was selected with an overall score of 7.5. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the aft avionics bay altimeter was assessed on price, weight, and assembly difficulty. The aft altimeter did not need to have programmable channels, as most altimeters allow for at least one ejection at Apogee. The egg timer Apogee was selected with an overall score of 8.4. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the alternative designs mentioned earlier was the was this design with two separation points, one at the nose cone and the forward airframe, and the other at the avionics bay and the aft airframe. This design was not chosen due to the lack of redundancy with the Jolly Logic shoot release device. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the selected de design for the avionics recovery. Uh, the separation points are in red, and they are the nose cone and the forward airframe. The forward avionics bay and the central airframe, the aft avionics bay and the aft airframe. Floating charges will be used to separate the forward avionics bay in the central airframe and the aft avionics bay in the aft airframe, with charge wells being used to separate the nose cone and the forward airframe. Uh, next slide, please. The first event will be at Apogee and it will be used to deploy the drogue parachute. It will use a floating black powder charge that, that will be placed closer to the motor assembly. Uh, next slide, please. The second event will happen at approximately 800 feet. It will be to deploy the payload and payload parachute. It will be the separation of the nose cone from the forward airframe and will use a charge well attached to the forward avionics bay. Uh, next slide, please. The third and final event will be the deployment of the main parachute from the central airframe. Uh, the altimeter in charge of this deployment will be in the forward avionics bay, so it will need to use floating black powder charges positioned closer to the aft avionics, uh, avionics bay. Um, uh, next slide, please. The, uh, in summary, the parachute selected is the, for the main parachute is the 84 inch Rocketman elliptical parachute with a descent rate of 18.5 feet per second. The selected drogue parachute is the 24 inch standard Rocketman parachute with a descent rate of 96.6 feet per second. And the payload parachute is the 48 inch Rocketman elliptical parachute with a descent rate of 13.5 feet per second. Uh, next slide, please. The selected recovery harness is the 7 sixteenths of an inch wide uh, tubular Kevlar that is 30 feet long and is manufactured by one bad hawk. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the forward avionics bay uh, and altimeter selected is the Enticore AIM USB altimeter. It will also be used as the backup altimeter with the initial payload ejection happening at 800 feet and the backup payload ejection charge detonating at 700 feet. The main parachute ejection charge will detonate at 600 feet, and the backup will detonate at 550 feet. The backups are delayed so that the force from both charges does not happen at once. And the backup is there in case of a partial or partial separation or failure of the primary charge. The aft avionics bay altimeter is the egg timer apogee. Uh, drogue ejection will occur at apogee. Uh, with the backup ejection occurring apogee plus one second. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a figure of the altitude over time with an apogee at 4,611 feet. Uh, next slide, please. The kinetic energy was calculated using a MATLAB simulation. Uh, Kinetic energy calculated is well below the required 
75 foot pound maximum. Uh, and kinetic energy was also calculated for the payload. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, descent time was calculated for the launch vehicle and payload. The launch vehicle is well under the maximum allowed of 90 seconds from Apogee. And the payload descent time is 96.9 seconds from Apogee. Uh, next slide, please. The drift radius was calculated using a MATLAB simulation and was also calculated by hand to verify the MATLAB simulation. Um, the differences between the simulation and the calculations by hand, we believe is due to intermediate rounding in the calculations done by hand. Uh, the drift radius for the launch vehicle is well within the maximum of 2,500 feet and the payload goes just beyond it, but is not underneath that requirement. Uh, next slide. So this is the preliminary uh, payload design and the picture you are looking at right here is an isometric view of the payload. And so the goal of the payload for this launch is to fall out of the rocket at an altitude of 500 to 100 feet to then land and then uh, orientate to within five degrees of vertical take a 360 degree panoramic picture and then wirelessly transmit it back to a ground station. Next slide. And so the primary structure of the payload is a series of disks that support all the electronics needed for the payload. This, this structure was chosen as it was a space efficient method of getting all the electronics on board. The ply plywood was also chosen as the material for these disks as it is easily machinable with the current tools and allows for easy prototyping with placement of the electronics. In addition, the plywood allowed us to keep the weight down of the payload to lower the center of mass. And this center of mass is important as because there is a steel weeble on the bottom. Next slide. So the weeble shown here is actually on the bottom of the payload. And this is used as a passive ability to get the payload to within that five degrees of vertical. And in addition to this, there's four servos with legs that are also attached to the payload. And these four servos with legs actively stabilize the payload. This will be done using a Raspberry Pi as the controller for the servos. Next slide. So the camera that is going to be taking the 360 degree panoramic video is the Pi Cam 360. Now this is an eight megapixel camera that connects to the Raspberry Pi via USB. This was chosen as it has easy uh, integration with the Raspberry Pi. And so it allows easy setting up for this payload. Next slide. So the wireless transmission, uh, we chose to go with a VTX card with a OSD, which is an on-screen display. Now this was chosen as it is easy to set up a VTX card as there's a lot of consumer hardware and support for it. The on-screen display was needed as this provides a way for the team to receive the GPS location of the payload shown on the screen. The VTX card is also gonna be at 200 milliwatts of RF power. Now this was chosen as NASA imposed a limit of 250 megawatts of RF power. So this is beneath it. And with this, an estimated range of 3,400 3, feet with a 2.5 DBI omnidirectional antenna was, was found. Now, so this video is provided for the VTX card by the composite video out of the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. And this is an NTSC format, which is required for the VTX card. And this video is then sent to a ground station where a screenshot is then captured with the picture to receive the final image. Next slide. To power the payload, there's gonna be three 3.7 volt, 850 milliamp batteries. Now these batteries were chosen as, the, as they are stored in the steel hemisphere. And so any bigger size in milliamp hours would, have, would not be allowed to fit within the steel hemisphere. And the 3.7 volts was chosen as the power system for the Raspberry Pi requires the 3.7 volts and combining the two 3.7 volts in series gets to a voltage of 7.4 volts, which is above the seven volts needed for the VTX card, the servos and the OSD. 
so that way these batteries can power all of them. And so again, the Raspberry Pi has the regulation board that takes that one 3.7 volt battery to get it to the correct amount of power. And this board is necessary as it regulates the power to the Raspberry Pi so there's not an unintended shutoff as it is a critical component of the payload. And the battery life is expected to be about two hours for all the components. Next slide. And so this is the wiring diagram of the payload. And as you can see here, this just shows all the servos and batteries and how they will all be wired. Next slide. So to retain the payload within the rocket, it'll be stowed in the payload bay with shear pins. And this payload bay will be sized to the payload so that there is very little room inside the rocket. In addition, a mechanical locking mechanism will be used to secure the payload. And this mechanical locking mechanism is simply a servo connected to a hook, which will then latch onto the payload to secure it during flight and then release it when it is time to be deployed. Next slide. So this is a breakdown of the full project budget. So we are primarily funded by the University of Florida's Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department with further support from the UF student government. And secondary funding will come from corporate sponsors and donations, our most recent being Aerojet Rocketdyne. Next slide, please. As a part of the plan to ensure team safety over the course of the project, activities will be supervised by appropriate personnel who will offer guidance and enforce safe practices. For manufacturing and assembly activities, launch preparation and testing operations, supervision will be undertaken by the safety officer. The team mentor will perform additional supervision for testing processes relevant to launch operations, final verification of the com complete launch vehicle assembly and launch preparation as well. For PDR, several different preliminary hazard analyses or risk assessments were conducted to identify all risks posed to team members on the path to project completion. These analyses consisted of personnel hazard analysis for all team activities, failure mode and effects analysis for all launch vehicle subsystems, and environmental concern analysis for risk posed by the launch site or affecting the launch site. Lastly, an overall project risk assessment was conducted to identify risks posed specifically to project completion. Next slide, please. The majority of the team's hands-on project work, including activities such as manufacturing, composites work, and testing, will occur in two locations, the UF Mechanical and Aerospace Student Design Center and the MAEC Machine Shop. All team members will be compliant with the rules of each facility, and these rules have been consulted in the creation of the hazard mitigation strategies to ensure consistency. As a result of current circumstances relating to COVID-19, time reservations are now required for spending, uh, for spending time in workspaces, which the team will utilize while also adhering to the University of Florida's virus spread prevention guidelines. Willing and qualified members who want to help with the manufacturing supervision will be given tests to grant them safety steward certification. Any students who are not certified stewards must be supervised by a steward or by the safety officer. Next slide, please. I think it skipped forward. All right, so the team, in the coming weeks, the team will be conducting uh, testing focused on the subscale launch vehicle. Um, these tests will consist mostly of material strength and structural testing and then separation tests fulfill the requirements set forth by NASA. In addition to this, we will also be constructing a payload prototype that will work alongside the subscale. And this will be specifically to test the design's ability to self ride itself autonomously. Um, following the subscale launch, the focus for the payload will shift to the electronic components and the software associated with it, which leads into the plan that the team has developed for the entire rest of the academic year um, and the rest of the competition to um, fulfill the requirements set forth by NASA and also for the team-derived requirements um, 
And if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to address some of those specifically. All right, so for the vehicle competition requirements, um, we, will, we will fulfill these, um, of course, through the test flights, but also leading up to the test flights. Um, we'll be doing a lot of separation tests. We'll also be using an instrument machine to conduct material tests and also be doing observational tests for structural reliability and reusability, um, doing things like drop tests. To fulfill the recovery system competition requirements, we will be working with ground ejection tests to ensure deployment and jettison for the payload. And we'll also be working with the electronic configurations and running interference tests to ensure the reliability of the onboard electronic devices. You can go to the next slide. All right, the payload is a big focus for testing this year. Um, so to fulfill those requirements, we're gonna be doing a lot of tests involving um, not only the payload prototype that we're building for the subscale, but also for the full scale model following the subscale launch. Um, this is going to include separation tests to simulate the jettison, also a drop test to ensure the structure's reliability and with a big focus on ensuring its ability to self ride itself autonomously. We'll also be running a lot of tests involving the electronics and the software's ability to transmit the photo once it's been taken and all those things to work together. And the payload is addressed even further in the team derived requirements, which we'll get into after this. Um, in addition to all of these testing requirements, we're also fulfilling all the safety requirements by including safety procedures along with every test procedure that we write. You can go to the next slide. As stated before, the team derived requirements focus a lot on the payload as that is a big priority for us this year. So a couple of, spe of those specifically are outlined here, which um, include including the verification plans for them. So as you can see, we'll be running range tests and transmission tests in order to really verify the transmitter's ability to complete to complete transmission and also running uh, extra tests in order to ensure that the vehicle can self ride itself autonomously. Okay, well, that concludes our presentation. Thank you all for sticking around. I will now open us up, open us, open us up to questions. Okay, so first question. Um, for your matrices, for specifically the parachutes, why did you decide to do CD for drogue and then drogue and then descent rate for everything else? Um, as your fourth uh, topic. Or yes, okay. Category. So the reason it is question drag for the drogue is because it was supposed to be descent rate, but my team member couldn't figure out how to put it into the open rocket simulation. Um, and then I kind of missed it when I was going back to a PDR. It's lucky, luckily it works out that all the drogues are the same size, so they have the same effective area. And then, they, then their coefficient of drag is what would determine their descent rate. Okay. Um, also in your presentation, I would emphasize what type of like batteries you're using, as well as like maybe I didn't, I wasn't there the whole time, but if you guys have like a basic CAD of it, like just to show how the whole slug thing works, I might have missed. So to add a add a slide about what it looks like for the avionics bay. I'm sure it's there. Yeah, I'm sure it's there. Right. Um, other things that we were talking about, um, you might want to sacrifice some of your descent rate to give yourself more time um, under your main because you're falling at, if I remember correctly, it was like 90 feet per second under drug or was it 70? The drug is 96.6. Okay, yeah. So basically, if you're falling at 96 feet per second um, and your main opens at like 650, like that ejection in and of itself takes like a minute. And then you have five seconds to open your main before you crash into the ground and kill someone. So if if last year was any sort of indication, we should be sacrificing more of our ground hit um, kinetic energy so that we can get more time to open our parachute, if that makes any sense. Um, because we are using like very high-end components and 
I mean, if Chris's rocket was any sort of indication, if it hits the ground, even if it goes pretty fast, it'll be okay. Um, so if your um, drift radius was like an issue and you weren't able to deploy sooner, then I would sacrifice obviously some of your descent rate to make sure that that main opens on time because I'm very scared that this year is gonna be a repeat of last year where all of our mains don't deploy on time and we have broken rockets. Um, also, another thing, your um, timing for your payload deploying was so very close to your main deploying and you're falling at 90 feet per second that that is like a one second difference. And you could be under some forces of that first ejection whilst the second ejection happens, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Um, so that is also a pretty big concern. But um, overall summary, uh, either make it so your drogue is falling slower um, so that you have more time to open up that main or change, your, change when your main opens um, because those are gonna be two issues that are gonna be real bad safety-wise if, if last year was any indication um, and yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions or feedback? I just noticed a small inconsistency. Um, I referred to both of our avionics bays as like the av as avionics bay for the payload and central. And then um, on your slide, we have forward and aft. So I think that was a last minute change that probably wasn't um, communicated. Okay. Um. I can change mine if you prefer the other one. Yeah, I think it'd be good just so that they're not like, why do you have like, like four different names of, um, yeah. So this is for the so avionics space only or for? So I noticed payload was called forward and aft or okay. payload, yeah, payload was called forward and the central was called aft. So those, the title slides on, um, the title slides on Colin's part. Okay. So we can just verbally clarify that for degree, I think. I think you passed it. I did? Okay. Yeah, there. Like one more. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. We can just specify that this will be the altimeter that's deploying parachutes versus payload. Yeah. Okay, well, like, sure, oh, go ahead. Uh, you highlight all your big numbers, like um, your apogee, that should be highlighted, and someone should say that number. Um, numbers like your stability, um, you should be saying those numbers and emphasizing them um, more than I think you were. Uh, um, some of the slides you went past, like the descent rate, you kind of just like, this is our descent rate, next slide. But like the really big mission critical things, you should be like hammering those down because they have a checklist basically that they're like, okay, yeah, that's safe, that's safe. Because they when they do your actual proposal or your actual PDR, they skim through that document real fast. So they want a good recap of everything in this presentation. If that makes any sense. Did you guys get, um, I'm not sure I wasn't watching, but did you guys get the thrust to weight ratio? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Okay. Was... Think, uh, if you guys wouldn't mind, can you guys go to like like the motor selection, like basically Matthew sections? Yeah. Yeah. Right Sorry about that. Yeah. So what was it like? Thrust to weight has to be greater than uh, five? Yes. Okay. I can't. How do I move this? I don't know. Dude, I max. I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, max is crazy, bro. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay, you got it. She's out of there. Okay. I just I mean, that's cool that you guys did. <laughs> no, I'm just looking. I'm just looking. <laughs> um, 
I guess next slide, I guess. Yeah, just like scroll, scroll through real quick. That was the one for motor selection. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I like how you did it more than me, honestly. But yeah, it's all, everything looks good so far. Well, I think he has his. Oh, yeah, there's the one about the apogee and the. Um, yeah, that one's just the altitude oh. over time and the apogee. Okay. Did you have um? You have a um? You have a stability one. Do you have a velocity yes. with time? Not in the presentation. I was in the. I put it in the report, but not in the presentation. Do you state your max velocity? They're gonna want to know that at least. Or your mock. Uh, no, your max. Your max. Your velocity. They're gonna want to know. We we stated velocity at rail exit. Oh yeah. One thing I forgot to ask. Um, is it mission critical that you are always in contact with your payload? Like, if you lose connection, is that like? mission loss or is no that as long as we have connection when it lands okay yeah be very careful because if you like do the math of how you're set up um your drift radius isn't included in that five degree offset so if you go up and you drift your full drift radius and you start at five degrees from vertical you're going to be and and launch pad is like a multiple hundred feet away from oh, you at the start of the launch, yeah, yeah, yeah. you are going to come out of your radius. And I mean, you probably won't because you probably won't experience those winds, but this is a question that they would ask. They would ask you to do the whole calculation of considering that angle, considering your drift radius, considering the pad is yay feet away. Um, and it could possibly screw you guys over. Yeah, especially if you go into the wind and it sends it up flying, like it's going to go far. Yeah, just keep considering it. I know I mentioned it last meeting as well, but. It's definitely a good point. All right, I mean, everything looks good up from, from my point of view. Um, yeah, you guys are good. I do have a few questions. Um, for Colin, you said that you calculated the ejection charges based on ideal gas law. What PSI were you basing that off of? And did you compare it to online calculators for black powder? I did not compare it to online calculators with black powder, um, but I did it with a force of, I believe, 50 pounds. Uh, that's just something I would double check. And another thing I noticed is that the backup charges are about the same mass as the primary charges. Yeah. Um, generally, you want to add like half a gram onto the primary charge just to ensure that if the primary charge isn't strong enough, the backup charge has enough power to get that out. Okay, I wasn't sure how much to add to it, so I didn't add a whole lot. Yeah, that's fine. Um, just something for CDR to consider. Okay, thank you. And then another question they might ask is why we didn't just skip the Jolly Logic for our for our alternative recovery design. What do you mean by skip? Like. Uh, we said that we were limited by the lack of redundancy in the Jolly Logic. They might ask why we aren't deploying our main with our payload, basically. Okay, yeah. Um, I have an answer for that. And it's so that we can avoid tangling our payload parachute with our main parachute and recovery harness, and so that they hopefully don't collide mid descent. And then Alex. I noticed you said you're using three batteries yeah. and a voltage of 7.4. Yeah. Uh, how are you doing that? How are you actually connecting them to give a voltage of 7.4 with three? Yeah, they're connected in series. It's two of them. It's two 3.7 volts connected in series and then another 3.7 volt. So would the 3.7 volt be in Parallel? What do you mean parallel? Like, no, they're in the, so two of them are in series and then one of them is used for the Raspberry Pi. So it's completely separate. 
Okay, okay. That makes more sense. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can definitely make that more clear. Yeah, because the way like I understood, I thought it was three in series or two in series and one parallel, but that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Okay, um, one additional question. So the entire altimeter uses 3.7 volt uh, batteries? Just to clarify. Or is there nine volts as well for your ejection charge? The, for the altimeters, we're really using a nine volt battery in the payload. Oh, this is payload. Okay, never mind. I was so confused. Yeah, okay, cool. And this isn't really a question, but a little bit of a suggestion is uh, there might be a way to put our Raspberry Pi in a sort of like sleep state. So we're not transmitting video and not uh, doing any unnecessary operations and that might be able to extend our battery life. Um, just something to look into in case it becomes yeah. an issue. Yeah, I mean, it'll definitely have to depend on testing. But I mean, the way I saw it was I tried to make it as simple as possible. So I think with now two hours of battery life for on the launch pad, I feel like that should be good enough. But if it does come an issue in testing, yeah, we can definitely get some like MOF sets or something to have the Raspberry Pi control the power. Okay, well, if that's all the questions, that concludes the SL side of the presentation. Uh, Joel, do you have anything to add for the GBM? Uh, not really. <laughs> I think next GBM will be in two weeks. Unless IREC has anything else to add. Yo, guys, come out to our next IREC meeting. We got so much work to assign because we got so much work to do. Also, come to our next manufacturing meeting because it's super fun. Um, look at these guys having the greatest of fun <laughs> discussing fin fillets, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so come by. Um, make sure if you come by to tell me that you're coming by because we have a maximum amount of people in the lab, but we haven't even been hitting close to that number, so it probably shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, come by. It's super fun. Just add on to that. SO will be get will be beginning manufacturing within the next three weeks. Actually, we'll be finishing manufacturing within the next three weeks. So within the next week and a half to two weeks, you can expect an announcement. It'll probably be probably be a week or two of straight manufacturing. So definitely, we'll keep you guys updated on that. Uh, we're gonna start as soon as we can get our ports ordered. Yeah, just keep an eye out in Slack for everything. Join all the Slack channels to get announcements from everybody. So if that's it, um, we'll see you guys in two weeks. They'll just keep an eye out for announcements everywhere. And um, yeah, we'll see you then. Thanks for coming out. Yes.